All right, let's go ahead and move on to the second section, Catalog of Essential Functions. So what we're going to be looking at are the functions that uh, every Calculus One student needs to know going into this class. So here they are. First of all, all the power functions. That means x squared. You need to know this is a parabola that opens upward. Um, x cubed looks like this. All of these pass through the origin. x to the fourth power kind of looks like a parabola also. x to the fifth power kind of looks like the cubic. x to the sixth power looks like the uh, quadratic again. Let's put all the even power functions up just so you can see them. So notice the behaviors start off again with the x squared. Um, notice what happens. x to the fourth, there's something interesting happening here at, a neg at negative one and positive one. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here so you can see that. Um, between zero and negative one and zero and positive one, the x to the fourth power, which is the green one here, is below x squared. But as I go out and show a little more past negative one, and past positive one, x to the fourth is bigger than x squared, is, which is what you would expect. And then x to the sixth, you can see here between uh, negative one and one, it's below x to the fourth and below x squared, but once you get past one, you're above. And then on the cubes, let me put in the cubes and take out the squares here, or the odd power, sorry. Um, here's x cubed, x to the fifth, again, is below x cubed until you get to one and then it's, it's above it. So everyone should know the power functions. The negative power functions are x to the negative one, x to the negative two, so on and so forth. But then x to the negative one means one over x. Those negative power means drop the uh, base into the denominator. So here's one over x, very, very important function. It's a rational function. It has a vertical asymptote here, horizontal asymptote here. We'll talk about that later. Um, x to the negative 2 looks like this, almost like a little volcano, but it keeps going up forever and ever. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so you can see a little more of the graph. Here's x cubed, or sorry, 1 over x cubed, and then 1 over x to the 4th looks like a volcano again, and 1 over x to the 5th. And you can zoom in, zoom out, take a look at what the relationships are between these. Again, uh, you can look at, you know, where, where they're bigger or smaller than the other ones. The root functions, so square root of x right here, uh, cube root of x looks like that, fourth root of x looks like that, fifth root of x, sixth root of x, and again you can come in and zoom in a little bit or zoom out. Okay, let's see here. Make sure you don't do that right. All right, polynomial functions. So polynomial functions are basically, uh, you've got your variable x in there somewhere raised to um, integer powers. So right now I have a degree one polynomial. That means the highest power on the x is one. And then what you can do is you can change this. You know, this is a line basically. You can change the slope of the line. Um, and then you can also uh, change where the where this x-intercept is, where the root is. So if I want that root to be at 3, that means right here, and then of course it moves the line over and um, it changes the equation of the line. So let me get the slope back to 1. So this is the line x minus 3, which you might recommend, recognize with uh, you know f of x equals mx, b, uh, mx plus b or y equals mx plus b. Here's your slope, here's your y-intercept. Y-intercept is is uh, negative 3, the slope is uh, 1, which means up 1 over 1. So you just get a line. And if you change the slope, you change the slope to 2. Try to get to 2 here. There we go. Now 2x minus 6, right here, you can see uh, slope is, uh, I'm sorry, y-intercept is negative 6, slope is up 2 over 1. So that's a degree 1 polynomial. A degree 2 polynomial is a quadratic function. So now you have something like 2x squared minus 6x. You can see here you've got parabola opening up. If you move this over, uh, make it negative, the parabola will open down. Um, since I have two roots, that's two places where the parabola hits the x-axis. I can change that, boom. Uh, let me make my window a little bigger so you can see this. There you go, that changes the range of what we're looking at. 
Um, if you go to third degree polynomial, it's going to look something like that. So now we have a third root. So we already have a root at, at uh, let's see, we have a root at three and negative five. Let me do another one at three. So let me get something like this. And here's the equation of it. I'm going to also change this to, let's make this a uh, positive one. Yeah. There we go. So this is x cubed minus x squared minus 21x plus 45. So there's your poly polynomial, third degree polynomial. Yep. Fourth degree polynomial looks like this. I can add another root here. Let's see, how about negative four? So you can play around with this. The, the main idea is that polynomial functions, um, when you look at them, they're nice and curved and smooth. They go you know, up and down, up and down. That is if it's not a line. If it's a line, of course, it's just straight. But all, all other polynomials, uh, degree greater than one, are going to be some sort of curved, smooth um, function. All right, rational functions. This was pr a huge part of uh, college algebra. You basically have a polynomial divided by a polynomial. So some polynomial on top, some polynomial on the bottom. This little table over here allows you to just change you know, each the, the numerator and denominator functions. So right now, my numerator is a degree one polynomial, which means that its highest power of x is one. Uh, the root is zero. So as you can see, I can change my root to, let's say, x uh, one. So it changes it to x minus one. That changes some things in the graph. Um, I can change my denominator to degree one, and it changes the graph. So again, you can mess around with this. Main idea is that with rational functions, you normally have these things called vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes. Um, probably spent a lot of time uh, learning how to graph those. All right, next thing, trigonometric functions. So you've got your basic sine function here. Uh, cosine looks like that. You've got the tangent function. I'll take the sine and cosine out. There's your tangent. Tangent has some uh, vertical asymptotes um, going on here. You got your cosecant function, which looks like this. Cosecant is actually the reciprocal of sine, so if you put the sine in, you can see the relationship between the two. Um, you go, oh, you should also have the secant function. You should remember that. Uh, that's related to the cosine function. You take cosecant in there. There's how secant and cosecant, I mean, secant and cosine are related. Uh, we're gonna pause real quick here. He's just a second here. Yeah, but we are being stupid. Okay, what a gap to the old bit. All right, sorry about that. Get back to this. Uh, lost, yeah. There we go. Okay, so um, now uh, we also have the cotangent function here, so I'll take everything else out. And if you want, you can, you know, zoom out to see more periods of what's going on, you know, there, there they are. And if you want, you can also zoom out on the y-axis some more, too, just to see how things work. All right, so you should know those basic six trig functions. All right, exponential functions. e to the x, this is what e to the x looks like. Uh, 2 to the x is a little different, but it still has the same sort of shape as e to the x. 1 half to the x is also an exponential function, but it goes the other direction. Um, that's because the, the base here is less than one. Uh, then we have the log function, natural log. So there's natural log. We have log base two of x, which looks like that. Again, very, very similar. And then log base one half of x, which goes the other direction. Also, um, I, all, I put in here, um, show the identity. That's because there's a relationship. E to the x and natural log of x are inverse functions. So if you look at the identity, um, which is the function f of x equals x, e to the x and natural log of x should be a reflection over this line. You can tell, you know, if I take this point reflected over this side, I get this. Take this point reflected over that dotted line, I get this, and so on and so forth. So reflection of e to the x over the identity gives you its inverse function, natural log x. And you can do that for two to the x and log base two you can see that those two are reflections. And then you can do it for this one also. So you can see these two are inverse functions. But that is 1 half to the x and log base 1 half x. All right, let's talk about transformations of graphs of functions. So if you're given a function f that you know, it's, know what the graph looks like, okay? So we have to assume first that we know 
what something looks like. Then if we want to move it vertically or horizontally, what we do is the following. If we add a number to the function, it goes shifts up by that much. Subtract a number, it goes down. If we add a number within the function, it shifts to the left by that much. That's actually opposite of what you would think. You would think adding means go to the right, but when you add inside the function, it goes to the left. When you subtract inside the function, it goes to the right. All right, vertical and horizontal stretching and reflecting. So if we take some number, some constant C, which is greater than zero, so it's positive, if you put that in front of your function, it's going to stretch it vertically by a factor of C when the C is bigger than one. It'll shrink it when it's between zero and one. If we put it inside, it shrinks it horizontally when C is bigger than one. If we put the C inside the function, it shrinks it horizontally, or stretches it horizontally um, when C is between zero and one. If we put a negative in front of the function, it flips it over the x-axis. Put a negative inside the function in front of the x, it flips over the y. So let's take a look at all that. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to take just one function that everyone should know what it looks like, which is a quadratic function. That's x squared. Now, if I want to change a, that is the number in front of x squared, that should stretch it vertically. So here I put two there, nothing changed. That's because I'm not showing it. Boom, there it is. So comparing again, this is what it normally looks like. If I put two in front of it, it stretches it vertically. So it pulls every point up vertically. Um, if I stretch it even more vertically, three, you can see that, that pulled every point up even just a little more. Um, if I put a fraction in front, like one half, then it's going to shrink it vertically. So every point that used to be on x squared now gets pulled down. If I make it a negative in front, like let's say negative one, it flips it over. So now I have the reflection over the x-axis. In all these cases, you can see what the function is right here. This is really just saying negative, um, this is just x, so this is just negative x squared, as you can see. If I do negative two x squared, it shrinks it, uh, stretches it even more vertically, but it also flipped it over. If I want to go and change the B inside here, so that's going to do um, horizontal and horizontal shrinking and stretching, you can see how that would change the graph. Here I just shrunk it horizontally. Uh, I'm going to put that back to one. Uh, how about up and down shifts? That's uh, uh, vertical shifting. So if I add one to this, boom, it just brings the whole thing up one. If I subtract two, it brings the whole thing down. Here, I'm going to go a little bit big. Uh, I can only zoom in, sorry. There we go. And then the shifting left and right, again, if I put a positive number in there, it's going to go left two. If I put a negative number in there, it's going to go right. So you can see the function. So the basic idea, again, I mean, you're going to have to play with this and think about it a little bit. Every one of these numbers does something to the graph. You need to know what it does. Here's the same thing with the sine function. So I'll let you play with this. Here's the normal sign, stretching it vertically. Boom, I get a bigger amplitude. Um, I can change basically what we would know as the, per uh, the period by changing the number in front of x. And then I can move it up and down. And that's about it. So we won't go into that anymore. Now combining functions. Uh, this is just notation. Um, if we have two functions, f and g, there's different ways to put them together. The arithmetic combinations we can have is we can add two functions together. Here's the notation for it. So that's the sum of two functions. We can subtract the two, we can multiply the two, and we can divide the two so long as the denominator is not zero. And then we have a fifth um, operation or way of combining functions, and that's functional composition. And this is the notation for it. f of g of x equals this. That means you take the g function, plug it into f. So we're going to take a look at a couple examples here. So I give you two functions, f and g, ask you to find these things. And we'll do that in class. And then here's another two functions asking you to do the same thing. I'll do that in class. And then finally, the decomposition. This is this is something that's probably new to you. We'll do this in class. What we're going to do is we're going to start out with a function. We're going to try and rewrite that function as the composition of three different functions. So we'll do that in class. Um, just remember in this section, you're going to need to make sure you're very comfortable with the basic uh, the basic functions, all these up here. 
and then how, how you can move them around uh, by the uh, transformations.